Good morning, and um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm surprised that it's as big a turnout as this, I'm quite glad. Um, my talk uh, concerns um, using Network Miner um, to reconstruct network traffic as the title, but it also involves a bit of Wireshark. Um, so I was first shown this um, by my cousin who works in cybersecurity, and for me it just uh, kind of demystifies a lot of things about kind of how data is sent over the internet. So I'll start off with a bit about me. So um, I actually started off, um, I've always been fairly technical, but by the time I reached sort of my university choices, I decided to go into and do a degree in management and marketing. Um, I actually did work in marketing for a bit and realized it wasn't for me. And so I now um, I'm back in kind of technology. So um, I, put, I usually work in technical support and the company I work for doesn't really like me kind of, or like anyone putting out that um, who they kind of work with when they do these things. But it's, um, it's a fairly prominent brand who had a big announcement on Monday, I'll say, just to kind of thing it. But uh, I'm a genius as well. So I'm um, used to kind of diagnosing and helping people. But to kind of benchmark, give myself a benchmark and show people my level of knowledge, I also took the CompTIA Security Plus. Um, although I've since realized that really should kind of go through all sorts of steps up to it. I just went straight in for Security Plus and just passed, luckily. Um, so I won't go into too much depth because I think it's better at the end to see why this is such a good demo. But um, this is just a small look at how kind of networking, I suppose, in terms of the internet networking works. And for me, and I'll explain why afterwards, it makes it a bit more approachable for people. Um, so we'll go to the demo. So, first of all, um, we'll get a Wireshark. Well, I've already got the Wireshark capture. The, when I pre um, prepared this, I made sure to not need the internet at all. Um, but in theory, you would go on to Wireshark and you know browse to a website and um, capture your data. So, um, as well, I the site I've used to capture my data is the University of Oxford. So um, there's a website out there called Why no HTTPS, which just lists quite prominent websites that still don't have HTTPS uh, enabled on their sites. So this makes this demo really quick and easy because you don't need to mess around with, you know, kind of getting into the data and encrypting it. And one of them is Oxford University that still use just plain old HTTP for their website. So when you're in Wireshark, um, if you... If you've ever ran this before, in your home, even on your home network, you'll get masses and masses of data. Um, even things like smart TVs are popping up in there constantly look, um, pinging your network. But for this, I'm just going to um, restrict it down to HTTP. So you'll see a little bit. When I did this, the only site I browsed to was Oxford University, so it makes it really clear. But you'll see things mentioned where it says Oxford sites files. So you will in there somewhere see listed JPEG images, but I suppose it's a bit of a convoluted way, but this is for my demo. So when you're in Wireshark, if you go to follow and then HTTP stream, at first you'll get this kind of the cookie data and things, the get requests, things like that, but we're not actually going to use this form of the data for it. Um, but when you're in here, you'll flip into raw and this will give you the, the kind of the hex values for all the data that's going through. So it's, it's not really intelligible. It might be to some people, but it's certainly not to me. Um, once you're in here, all we need to do is we need to capture this file. This is all we want for our HTTP. So you can go save as and save it as just a plain text file. So it'd be a bit silly if I hadn't already prepared this. So I'm going to just skip on again. So once we've got our, our text capture, and this is literally the entire file of um, or the, the flow just from Oxford University's homepage. So there's a lot of data. Um, heck, this is a, a program called Hexfiend on the Mac. I'm sure there's an equivalent on Windows, but this is Hexfiend. So it will show you some of the data that we saw previously just on the right there. Um, but if we go, this is a site I've used. Uh, and Gary Kessler, that's it. Um, he has a database of like common file signatures. So I'm going to do this with a JPEG. So with a JPEG, in those hex values, a JPEG file will always start with FFD8 and always end with FFD9. So knowing that, we can go back to our um, file. And don't worry, I'm not going to actually do this because this would be rather boring for you all. But we would search FFD8 
Um, note down the value on the left hand side that says, you know, 247,000. Then search FFD9, which should take us to the very next value. Or the one in that, for that image just at the end. Once you've got that, you can highlight it and extract it through. And then you'll end up with a file. Unfortunately, it spoils it with a quick look, but it, you will end up with a file that looks like this. So this starts with our FFD8 and will end with FFD9. So that is an entire image file, but it doesn't look like it. It just looks like a text file. But all you need to do is whack on .jp, .jpg at the end, .jpg, and you'll end up with your image file. So this isn't actually on the website anymore, but if you really want it, I can send it to you. Um, but that's just a, a kind of a quick demo on how sort of easy it is to extract it. But that Oxford Uni University website, even when I used it, had um, probably a good few sort of 10, 20 images. It'd be a bit too laborious to then go through and, and extract every time. So for the second half, um, there's a tool, which is actually a Windows tool, but you can run it on Mac OS with Mono, called Network Miner. So we'll just start that up a second. So this makes it a bit easier to extract things. Admittedly, image files aren't going to be the most sensitive pieces of data you've got. But um, another thing to note as well with our packet capture, so uh, Wireshark now saves them in a new format. Most tools that kind of pair in with Wireshark do them in an old style, kind of classic packet capture file. The other one had PCAPNG. So to be able to import it, you need to set, just go into Wireshark and save that file um, as a PCAP file. And unfortunately, it, this is because it's a Windows uh, file. I just need to find this a second, desktop, network miner. So just get my PCAP there. So this will just kind of load through, and I'll expand it a bit. So it, it does quite a bit. Um, you can literally go through, and it's got things like messages in there that have uh, come forward. I'm going to skip past that and come back to it. Uh, DNS requests that are in there. So loads, but for now, I'm not really that interested. In this images tab, you can see everything there. So there is about 20, 25 images in there, but they're all quickly and easily viewable, like you can double tap and it will actually go into a preview on a Mac. So if you were looking for sensitive images, it's dead easy, come straight out. So that, that is really the, the kind of the demo of the technology. But um, the reasons why I kind of want to show that, uh, as I say, so when my cousin first showed me that demo, it, it's kind of for me demystifying on how things work. So for a an outsider, person not in technology. So I, w I will admit every day my job involves me talking to people who will usually say things like, oh, I'm not very good with technology is the usual line. For me, that shows you that instead of it almost being sort of, there's a physical file or it's just some sort of magic coming through the internet down the phone line, it's much easier to see that actually it's just a list of instructions. Most things with networking, with any form of computing, is just a list of instructions, and it makes it a lot simpler and easier for people to understand. I can't count the amount of times I have people that come in with things like Snapchat crashing or really basic things like that. I even had someone where they'd taken a screenshot of their home screen, set it as their wallpaper, and then come in, and so it looks like there were two times on top of each other, and they asked to have their phone replaced for that because you don't know why it's doing it. For all you know, it's just there's a problem with my phone, my computer, my whatever. You don't know what's going on, so you just think it just needs replacing. And I would do that with things like my car. I'm not very kind of, I'm not a car person. I would rather just get it swapped every time. So it just really makes it simpler for people to understand. So it's just, it's a great short little demo. I mean, it's only taken me sort of 10 minutes there to show you. And hopefully you've understood anyway. Um, it's just a really quick way to kind of build understanding and show people on that. So, excuse me. So, any questions? Um, well, I think I used Homebrew. Oh, um, if, if you don't know what Homebrew is, it's like a package manager on a Mac. So, 
Um, instead of, if you want to download something like Mono, Homebrew will fetch everything else it needs as well. Instead of you having to f fetch like 10 files to get one thing working. So just literally use got Mono with that and then got the executable network miner file and it worked. Um, the version I'm using is just the free version. They do like a, probably community edition it might be called or something and there's a premium version which does a lot more and that would probably be the more kind of juicy stuff but for me experimenting the, the free version is good enough anyone else no hopefully that entertained enough and um, got off to a good start um, but thank you all for coming again